Conservation of energy is one of the most powerful concepts in physics. So let's get started. Let's start with the types of energy that we know about. Mechanical energy. I'm going to use the symbol E for mechanical energy. And we have several types that we know about right now. The first is energy of motion, kinetic energy. Usually we use the symbol K for kinetic energy, energy of motion. The second one is what we call potential energy, energy an object has due to its location in the gravitational field. It's basically stored energy. And the third is also stored energy, potential energy, but this is stored in a spring that's either stretched or compressed. So sometimes we call that elastic or spring potential energy. Right now, that's our view of the world. Something can have energy because it's moving, kinetic energy. It can have energy because of its location in a gravitational field, gravitational potential energy. And springs can store energy, spring potential energy. And that's it. That's our view of the world. As our model of the world becomes more realistic and more complex, then we can include other types of energy. In a few weeks, we'll learn that not every object is a point object. Some objects have dimension which means that they can rotate. And when something is spinning, when it's rotating, it also has a type of kinetic energy, rotational kinetic energy. So we'll add rotational kinetic energy to our list. Next quarter, you'll learn that objects can also have electrical charge. So they can have energy due to their location in an electric field. So we'll add a potential energy term for that. So as our model of the world becomes more complex and more realistic, because it's explaining the world we live in in better detail, we can continue to add terms here. Energy is one of those things that seems a little weird at first because there are so many different kinds that they don't seem related. Energy due to motion, energy due to a location in a gravitational field, energy due to location in an electric field energy stored in a spring. They seem very different. But as far as a physicist is concerned, they all give us the ability to do work. They all sort of have this same characteristic. An analogy that we typically use is money. There are all different types of money. There's the paper money we have in our wallet. There's coins. You can write a check. You can use a credit card. All different very seemingly different forms of money but all of them give us the ability to make a purchase the ability to buy something so energy is very similar seemingly disjointed but all of it has this underlying purpose it has the ability to do work our conservation of energy tells us in physics that energy cannot be created or destroyed only two things can happen to energy. It can be transferred from one object to another, and it can be transformed from one type to another. But it cannot be created or destroyed. So our principle of conservation of energy says that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be transferred from one object to another or transformed from one type to another. So something can start out up high in a gravitational field and we can let go of it 
and that stored energy, that potential energy due to its location in a gravitational field, will start being transformed into energy of motion. The object will move, the force of gravity will do work on it, and our object will begin to fall. And as it falls, it moves faster and faster until it gets to its lowest point. It's the split second before it hits the ground, it's moving the fastest. So energy was transformed from stored energy due to its location in the gravitational field into kinetic energy, energy of motion. It lost its potential energy as it came down lower and lower in the gravitational field and as it lost its potential energy it gained kinetic energy. What we would like to say is that the initial mechanical energy of our system is going to equal our final mechanical energy. That the energy is going to be a constant. That's what I just told you, isn't it? The energy is going to be a constant. Well, that's true in general for a big system. For the universe, that statement is true. But typically, we're interested in, in a particular system. A block sliding down a, a hill. Uh, gases inside of a jar, things like that. We're interested in a particular system. Our system is smaller than the universe, and that means that there's an exterior part of our system that can reach in and do work on our system, or maybe our system can do work on the environment. We have to be able to account for that. So in other words, let's take our money analogy. If we're in a classroom and the doors are locked, the amount of money in the classroom is fixed and it might move around maybe one person will take somebody else's money and then they'll have more and the other person has less but the total money in the classroom remains the same right that's our principle of conservation of energy but if we open the door and allow other people to come into the classroom or people to leave then money can come in money can leave it the, the amount of money might change and so that's what we have to account for so this is what we'd like to say. We would love to say that the initial energy and the final energy are the same. But two things can affect this. The first is external forces doing work on our system. If our system has a certain amount of energy in it and an external force comes in and does work on it then we are going to have more energy at the end our final state is going to have more energy than our initial state but we want to keep this equality so what do we do we have to add something to our initial state to make these the left side of this equation and the right side of this equation equal e initial plus the work done by external forces equals E final. There's only two terms we have to deal with. One of them is external work done on our system and we have to have it on the left side of our equation. If something comes in and does positive work on our system we end up with more energy. So we have to have a positive number on the left side of this equation to keep the equality. If our system does work on the environment, if we lose energy to the environment, then we end up with less energy in our system. We've given up some of it. Then we have to subtract something from the left side. So the work done by external forces, if the work is done on our system, this is a positive number. If the work is done by our system, it's a negative number. If our system is losing energy, this is a negative number. So it makes the equality work out really nicely. The other thing that can happen, the other thing that can happen is that energy can be transformed into a type that we can't account for anymore. I've already described what happens when a box falls in a gravitational field. The potential energy changes into kinetic energy. And those are both energies that we can account for. We can figure out what they are. We can deal with that very easily. But what happens if we just slide a block across a table? 
push on a block, it slides across the table until what happens? It comes to rest. The energy of motion isn't there anymore. Because of friction with the table, the block has stopped moving. The molecules in the table are moving faster, the table is hotter. We've transformed the energy of motion into heat. And we can't deal with that right now. We don't have those tools yet. But we can figure out the work done by the force of friction. So I'm going to say here the work done by what we call non-conservative forces. And basically what we mean is friction and air resistance, I guess, too. But typically in our problems, it's friction that we're dealing with. We've converted some of our energy of motion into heat, and we, we don't know how to account for heat yet. Sometimes we call that internal energy. The energy that we've captured as heat is an internal energy in our system. But it's, it's not one of our three mechanical energies that we know how to deal with. What do we do? If we have non-conservative forces, if we have friction in our system, then E initial is not quite going to be E final. We're going to end up with less. So we have to do something to keep the equality the same. We either have to subtract something from the left side of our equation or add something to the right side of the equation. And typically, we write it like this. And why do we write it with a plus sign? Because the work done by non-conservative forces is negative. So if we start out with a certain amount of mechanical energy, like pushing the block across the table, it starts out moving across the table with a lot of mechanical energy, and then it ends up at the end with no mechanical energy. It's not moving. So we've had to subtract the work done by friction along the way. So that's a negative number. All right, so we're done. This is our equation. I'm going to write it out one more time, replacing these E's with the actual three types of mechanical energy that we know of. So what do we have? We have kinetic energy initial. We might have gravitational energy initial. We might have some springs in our system. That's our initial mechanical energy. And then we have to account for if external work is being done or if we have friction in our system. And that would equal our final kinetic energy, our final gravitational potential energy, and our final spring potential energy. In this equation, it's uh, handy just to write that out when you're doing an energy conservation problem. And then cross things off if they're not in your... If you don't have springs in their problem, then you don't have any energy stored in your springs. Cross those terms out. So this is the equation that I always start with.